Could I have your attention? I would like to uh, welcome all of you to the 21st annual Philip Clark Family Lecture in Bioethics. Philip Clark, Dr. Philip Clark was a distinguished Notre Dame uh, alum. He won every award you could win at Notre Dame from the Alumni Association. He finished his career as at the dean of the medical school at the University of Colorado. He loved this university, and he endowed this lecture series 21 years ago to bring in each year a distinguished speaker on bioethics, to speak to an audience composed of the physicians who would be here for our annual spring medical ethics conference, and to students on campus, especially pre-medical students. And we're very happy. Many of the people sitting down front are here for our medical ethics conference, and I'm happy to see so many, uh, uh, so many students uh, in the audience, many of whom are pre-medical students, but, uh, but not all. Now, this series was inaugurated in 1988, and since it was inaugurated, we have had speaking in it many, indeed most, of the leading figures in contemporary bioethics. Only one of these speakers has appeared uh, twice, Dr. Edmund Pellegrino, and after today, we can add that only one speaker has appeared three times, Dr. Edmund Pellegrino. I should say, I it was pointed out to me by a friend that today is the feast day of the blessed Pellegrino. Did you know that, Edmund? Uh, ah, okay. He knows everything. <laughs> he knows everything. A Franciscan carried away by Fran yeah, Well, you, maybe you were going to talk about this by the preaching of St. Francis. I, I rem at first, I thought St. Francis had been carried away by the blessed uh, Pellegrino's preaching, and I, and I was going to, w that seemed to me an appropriate story to introduce you, but. Uh, Yes, right. You can fix it. You, you can do anything you want to do at the University of Notre Dame. Um, <laughs> Dr. Pellegrino, has, this is one of those introductions that sort of stops you in your tracks, because whatever I say, you won't believe me, the story of Dr. Pellegrino. He's been a towering figure in biomedicine, and not just biomedical ethics, for half a century. And I don't use that phrase loosely. In 1959, I make that. 50 years ago, he stepped into his job as professor and chairman of the Department of Medicine at the University of Kentucky Medical School, already a prominent figure in American biomedicine. In subsequent years, and I will do this very briefly and skip lots of things, he has held <coughs> positions as Chancellor of Health Affairs at the University of Tennessee, President of Yale Medical Center and Chairman of the Board of, of Trustees there, President of Catholic University and simultaneously professor of philosophy. He's been the director of the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown, generally regarded as the most influential ethics um, center, certainly throughout the time he was director of it. He's been director of the Georgetown University Center for the Advanced Study of Ethics, director of the Center for Clinical Bioethics at Georgetown Medical Center. If it were anyone else but Dr. Pellegrino, I would now say to you that he's crowned his career by being chairman of the President's Council on Bioethics. But in his case, I really don't know what, uh, what he might do next. Uh, this is just maybe another step on the way. The book is surely not closed on his extraordinary career. And I think I can say that throughout this time, you've always been a practicing physician. You've always had patients. And you still have patients, right? Still have patients, but you're probably you don't have room for any new ones. I, mean, I guess, but uh, a doctor. This simple list of significant posts, however, hardly uh, does justice to Dr. Pellegrino's contributions to the wider intellectual culture of contemporary biomedicine. While serving in these administrative posts, which would break almost anyone. He's produced a steady stream of important and influential books and articles uh, throughout his career, including, and let me just mention a few, Humanism and the Physician, A Philosophical Basis of Medical Practice, The Virtues in Medical Practice, and we could go on and on. He's also been a model 
to many of us about how to engage with one's opponents in these often very unpleasant disputes in biomedical ethics, to engage one's opponents with civility and gentlemanly behavior. I wrote this, the next sentence and then I, I thought better of it because I am trying to tell the truth, especially in this Lenten season. I said, Dr. Pellegrino has no enemies in contemporary bioethics. He has fewer than any of the rest of us. Let me put it that way. And even the people who may be his enemies would certainly love to go to dinner with him and uh, linger over dinner to uh, chat about their differences. He's been a leading public intellectual for this half century period, faithful to his Catholic beliefs and willing to engage a, a, in a broad, uh, a broad spectrum of opinions with which he, uh, with which he disagrees. He has um, received many honors, again, which I will not go through, honors from the church, from the medical profession, from various national governments, and from universities, including our own here. He is, I believe, I, I try to do quick research on this, and I think this is true, you're the only physician, I believe, to have received the Latari Medal. Is that right? You know, I think that's, that's right, uh, which we celebrated some years ago. Before Dr. Pellegrino leaves tomorrow, I hope we have time to sign him up for another Clark Lecture in, say, 2017, which will make him the fourth, the only person who's given the Clark Lecture four times. Let me mention that after this lecture, Dr. Pellegrino has agreed to sign. We have a splendid new book, which we just published, Notre Dame Press has just published under the auspices of the Center for Ethics and Culture, called The Philosophy of Medicine Reborn, a collection of his essays on the philosophy of medicine, edited by Tris Englehart and Fabrice Jodoran. Dr. Pellegrino has agreed to sign these books. We're also very proud to be... Uh, uh, to be publishing at the Center for Ethics and Culture a book called Medical Ethics at Notre Dame, which includes the first 12 Clark Lectures with responses from mostly Notre Dame philosophers and theologians, but people from around the country to each of them. And these books will also be, and, and Dr. Pellegrino's first two Clark Lectures are included in, uh, uh, in this volume with responses from from others. So these books will be available. Dr. Pellegrino has agreed to, uh, to sign them. Um, as I said, it's impossible to introduce Edmund Pellegrino, especially at Notre Dame, where we have appreciated his intellectual leadership, his sort of faithful commitment to principles at the heart of medical practice, and his joyful way of riding into battle over these uh, Matters. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Edmund Pellegrino. David. I think it's on now. Can you hear in the back? Okay. David, thank you very, very much. Uh, that sounded too much like a eulogy. <laughs> <laughs> and since I'm 89 years old, I begin to worry when people become that floored. But thank you very much. It's more an indication of your own charity and your own uh, goodwill toward people who need a little boosting once in a while. <laughs> Let me finish, if I may, the, uh, the having problems. Industrial <laughs> Well, <laughs> can you imagine an internist without a microphone? That's all we do. Uh, again, David, thank you. I won't repeat the. Uh, talk about the eulogy, but I will finish your story about the uh, Ed, Edmund the Saint. He was Irish, and he came down to northern Italy, as a matter of fact, and settled at a spa. And that's where the Pellegrino water comes from. Those of you who helped my family wealthy by 
<laughs> drinking it. We have nothing to do with it, believe me. But uh, it was established by this Franciscan monk who came at the time when the Irish were in the Europe and spreading the faith. So it was kind of a reverse lend lease kind of thing. Uh, I want to thank the Clark family for sustaining this lecture and the opportunities I've had here at Notre Dame to speak from time to time. I am going to, this evening, address not a subject of moral philosophy in the big sense of that term, but rather try to respond, because there are medical students and physicians here primarily, respond to a question that I've been hearing over and over again, and maybe Mark Siegel and my other medical colleagues have been hearing. And that is, today, in today's milieu, and by the way, I'm not going to be talking about how great things were in my day. That's not the point at all. But I am concerned about some of the questions I'm asked. One of them, over and over again, is what makes you think that medicine is a moral enterprise? I ask students in many medical schools as I travel around, why did you come to medical school? And they often will say, well, serve people and so on. And I say, do you know what the genesis of some of the ethical questions that you've been discussing? Why do we talk about medical ethics? Why is it a moral enterprise? And they really mean that, and they mean that with great sincerity. <clears throat> As you all know, medicine is in the middle of a identity crisis. It's in the middle of a great deal of questioning by the society around us. It's in the middle of a sense of depression on the part of some of the younger and older physicians for a variety of reasons. I'm not going to comment on all of those. I want to go directly to the point, and that is, why is it a moral enterprise? What makes it fundamentally a moral enterprise? And with it, a second question, which is the one that's related to the notion of a moral philosophy, uh, the second question that underlies all of this. And by the way, if it is ethical, whose ethics are you talking about? Yours? Someone else's? How do you justify the ethical positions that you take? I'm going to look at those two questions. First, in relationship to the medical profession, and then the other helping professions, as I've said in the title of my talk. And I want to put them together. Let me begin with the first piece. In my mind, and I get into trouble with sociologists and political scientists and policymakers all the time, the heart of the enterprise of medicine is the physician patient relationship. Now, what is it about that relationship which puts demands on physicians that make it an enterprise that's moral in the very first instance? Step back for a moment. What's the profession? That's something the educators are vexed about and defining over and over again today. I'm sure if you're medical students, you've had someone tell you what the characteristics were. Of a, and there's nothing wrong with those attitudes and uh, affected attitudes that should be exhibited by a physician. But it doesn't get to the heart of the matter. Let's go to where our first contact with the 
patient is. Whether it's in the hospital, on the gurney, on the operating table, in the study, in the examining room, and so on. We approach a human being who has come to the point where she <clears throat> or he believes that they cannot deal with something that's concerning them about their health as they define it, not you and me. And they come with the expectation that we will be able to help them. We are primarily a helping profession, helping someone out of the predicament of illness. So the person presenting to us is in the predicament of illness, and the predicament of illness is one which you have experienced or will experience or you have seen in your family. And the predicament of illness is one that puts you in a vulnerable position, in a position of dependency on another human being who you come to for help and assistance, on another human being whose character will modify very much how he or she approaches you. More important than that, it's a relationship of inequality. Inequality in the sense that whether you're a physician or not, you're in the same position. You have presented yourself to someone who professes that you might need. That's what the idea of profession means. It comes from the Latin word, which means to lap, speak aloud, to make a declaration, to make a commitment, to take a stand, to promise <laughs> something publicly. Now, I'm very happy that these days medical students take the Hippocratic Oath, leaving the content aside for the moment, on the entry into medical school. That's an act of profession. And what does that profession say? What is that act of profession when you enter medical school? It says, I am willing to accept the privileges, privileges, forget that you're paying for it, that's irrelevant, really. I know you'll say that's unpractical. It's impractical. It's not so. Accept the privileges of being a medical student. And the privileges are to be able to have access to accumulated medical knowledge of 3,000 years. To have the social sanction to invade the privacy of other people's persons. To learn <clears throat> and perform techniques when you're not qualified to do it under supervision, I would hope, and one of my concerns as a continuing to be teacher and continuing clinician at the bedside is the lack of proper supervision of the student who's learning. That privilege, the privilege of with responsibility gradually to become someone able at graduation not to be a finished physician, but to begin the work of a postgraduate education at the bedside. You're allowed to dissect, not so much as before, of course, to see autopsies, and actually carry responsibility for patients before you're capable, really, to do it safely in general. Those are privileges. Why do you do them? Society permits them and gives you a sanction because it needs to replace older physicians like myself. But in entering, therefore, you have made an act of profession. You've said, I accept it. I accept it publicly before everyone here when I put on my white coat. 
You do it again when you graduate, when you've got your diploma. I've been a university president. I've never created a <clears throat> position because you're created by the active profession. It is not, <clears throat> not the diploma that makes the difference. It is specifically your profession to the world around you at graduation. <clears throat> when you take an oath, again, leaving the content aside for the moment, because that's arguable, but you take an oath to act for something other than your own self-interest. Something other than your own self-interest. How many people do that in today's world? Or commit themselves to it? Or do it publicly? In the presence of their family, their friends, and the public in general. That is what it is to be a profession. All of those framed items on the wall do not make you a professional. The profession is the act of profession. Now, that act of profession is repeated every day when you walk into the room and you say, how can I help you? What can I do? How can I help you? What can I do? You may use a different phraseology, but essentially that's the idea. You offer yourself <clears throat> to another human being in that predicament of illness, of dependence, of anxiety, of pain, of suffering often, of lacking the knowledge to be able to treat, cure themselves, persons who are totally dependent. That is the heart of the matter. You have to live up to the expectations which you have deliberately, voluntarily offered to raise when you said, can I help you? Ask yourself if that isn't true. <clears throat> Ask yourself, isn't that what goes through your mind? <clears throat> and what are you concerned about when you walk into a doctor's office whom you have not met before? Or, unfortunately, maybe on the gurney brought in from the highway and someone with a white coat and a stethoscope in the pocket, I hope, not here. That's, don't worry about that. <laughs> but someone who presents themselves and makes that same promise, what can I do for you? I think if I went through this group, I would get the usual response. The first one would be, is she competent? And the second one would be, can I trust her? Her character the kind of person she is. Will she use her knowledge in my interest? Because the opportunities for exploitation are enormous when you're lying on the gurney. Not only the exploitation for exploitation, but deceit, deception. One can take advantage of that honorable, vulnerable person. Will this particular physician do that? That's a moral exchange, a moral encounter, one in which one person has presented herself or himself to someone in distress. Now you'll say, well, 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 and I hear this all the time, well, there's too much medicine anyway, you know, people are overtreated. Wait a minute. Who knows how to tell whether a person is genuinely ill, which includes more than the lump that you found or the blood that you passed in the stool? Who makes that judgment? The patient. That doesn't mean that you do everything the patient wants. I'm not going to get into the question of autonomy, etc., etc., at this moment. But I do want to tell you, as you probably know, there is an increasing movement to say, do we need doctors at all? 
do we need doctors at all? Or, as my good friend Robert Veach, and I do mean he's a good friend and a highly respected colleague of mine, says now, you, doctor, cannot tell what the good is for me. So here we have a whole set of questions which turn not so much on, forgive me, bioethicists, on a course in bioethics. It turns on the kind of person you and I are and how we use the knowledge we were privileged to get, which we professed we would use in the interests of the sick. I won't get into the economic dimensions or anything else. That's the heart of the matter. So that's why I call us a helping profession, a profession that reaches out to a human being in a state of uncertainty and a state of suffering. And now, in your minds are running all the bad doctors you have met. Yes, they're awesome. <coughs> Messiatry, which is the hatred or dislike of physicians, uh, is a study. In the 19th century, there were two huge volumes which have gone through dedicated to the subject of messiatry. Read Petrarch, read the epigrams of Marshall, and so on. Physicians have had their problems because we are human <coughs> beings. But that doesn't change the final reality. Suppose we were replaced by others, and a variety of different versions have been put forth. Would not the same moral requirements be imposed on those people who replace us, whether they're called doctors or not? You see, what I'm trying to say here is that the morality of medicine, the ethical problems of medicine, the ethical nature of medicine arises from the kind of activity medicine is. And whoever or by what name, and by the way, as I talk this way, I'm speaking to physicians, but I'm speaking to nurses, allied health workers, to all who confront human beings in the predicament of illness because of its specific existential, phenomenological aspects which create <coughs> the moral obligations. Now I am on a little bit of moral philosophy. I'm talking about discerning the ethics of the profession from the nature of the profession. It is what I call the internal morality of medicine. It arouses good argumentation with my philosophical friends, but I'm willing to engage in it. So why, what's so special? Special is that kind of relationship. Now you'll say others do that. Yes, they do, they do, they do. But <clears throat> none do it with situations that are so personal, so human, so involved with who you are and what you are mentally, morally, physically, psychologically. None that get so close into who you are if it's done properly. Can we tell then, or shouldn't we ask ourselves, what is the end of medicine? Now, to be a little philosophical, what makes it what it is and what defines it as a specific kind of human activity? Now, again, as I go through from this point on, I hope other health professionals will fill the blank with nurse, allied health worker, hospital administrator, yes, anyone involved directly or indirectly, in that encounter between a human being in a state of need and has something to do with the resolution of their problem. 
If that's so, then we look at the ethics of medicine. Yes, you've been talking about puzzles today. I'm involved in them all the time. I do ethics consultations. I see patients and so on. I know that world. I help to try to solve. But that is not the heart of the matter. Because ultimately, in, for example, the case that we looked at, a great deal depended as much on the intricate definition of what was death as on how you handle the uncertainties and how you engage in prudential judgment. Most of our <clears throat> medical decisions are not made on the basis of absolute information. We're dealing with uncertain outcomes in perilous situations, and we must act. <clears throat> That's another facet <coughs> of being a physician. You must act. And when we act, we are responsible morally and legally. I pound the table here a little bit because in this age of autonomy, I see too many physicians forgetting that one facet of this responsibility you've drawn upon yourself is not only to try to fit what you're doing into the patient's schema of good, but also having the courage and the responsibility to say, this is what I think is the right thing to do, and there are some things I will not do. Now, that goes against the modern notion of the patient gets everything they want. Bob Veach argues very cogently, and I recommend you read his book, very cogently that we physicians cannot know what's the good of the patient. And I think in some ways he's correct. We cannot know some aspects of the good. So let me describe a couple of levels of the good. I'm keeping my eye on the watch because I'd like you to get some questions here. The good of the patient, which should be the end of the encounter, the good of the patient, is a complex notion. Modern philosophers detest the idea of the good. They're afraid to deal with it. But nonetheless, we deal with it, ordinary human beings. Now, the good of the patient has four dimensions, at least as I see it. And those four dimensions are very relevant to the question that Robert Veach raises, which, if it were widespread, would say, patient is totally in charge. Now, that's an attractive notion, and I'm not opposed to that you will see in a moment. His syllogism runs as follows. One, most medical decisions have value intermixed with fact. That's true. Any physician here who practices knows that we have medical fact, but then they're funneled through the mind of a human being and they're valorized. Some of us accept this, some of us accept that, and with different degrees of intensity. So the medical good is a mixture of values, but that doesn't vitiate the fact that the lowest level of good is what we know to be the actual situation of this patient and what ought to be done from the point of view of our medical knowledge. I'm seeing that abandoned far too much. Bob Beat says we can't even know what it is. For example, he says that if you have a fractured arm, how long you keep the cast on is a highly individualized matter. Yes, I grant that. But as an orthopedic surgeon, I think you would say there are a certain number of days that are required for this kind of fracture. And if you remove it too soon, you're going to end up with a flapping arm. But Bob would say, no, I may want to accept that. Okay, that isn't, I'm not 
This isn't contra beach. It's just a different way of looking at it, which is ga gathering force, and that's why I want to say that we have the responsibility, and we do and can deal with the medical good, but the medical good is the lowest level of good of the patient that we see. So that we only deal with that lower level in the first instance, and then we go beyond it. The second level, and this is where autonomy becomes very important, is the patient's perception of the good based on what we offer and what he or she thinks it fits and how it fits into her life. That only the patient can decide. The third level is the level of the good for humans as humans. Those of you who are being trained here in the Thomistic approach will understand what that means. For others who are not, let's simply say, we're talking here about human rights, the dignity of the human being, which must be preserved, etc., etc. And then the highest level of good is a spiritual good. Not necessarily religious spirituality is used, as you know, today in a very, very wide set of activities that people are involved in, but something beyond which for most people is the most important thing in their lives. We as physicians have immediate responsibility for the medical good, to know the science of medicine, to be able to evaluate it, and to be able to advise. So that when the patient <laughs> says to you, what, doctor, do you think is the right thing for me? I'm tired in ethics consults, hearing physicians say no, I didn't tell them that. I told them these were the things they could do, and I want to know what they want. One of the members of our council, Carl Schneider, has written a beautiful book, I think, a very effective book, on the practice of autonomy. And he says that the American people have a very different notion of autonomy than the bioethicists. One, they want to know the facts. Two, they want to be able to say no. And I agree with both of those. And three, they want to know what the doctor thinks ought to be done. Therefore, the idea that you're telling the patient <clears throat> what you think ought to be done, <clears throat> what they primarily came for as a matter of fact, they can reject it you have a responsibility to make that clear in the moment of truth that comes when, what do you think? <coughs> Those are just some facets of this relationship which are changing. And I'm giving the background and backbone of that moment of truth when we say, <clears throat> how can I help you? What can I do? It's as simple as that. Now, just to include the other health professions very quickly, because I think the same thing happens in law, in ministry, and in education. In each case, <clears throat> you have a subject who is vulnerable, anxious, in need, needs help. A client needs justice or an advocate need someone who understands their levels of good. Minister encounters patients who need reconciliation with God, certainly in desperately dependent circumstances, extremely vulnerable, enormously anxious about their future, and then those who are students. You are at the mercy of your teachers in many ways. You're smart enough to know when they're wrong, but on the other hand, you can't always tell. They have an obligation to satisfy your need for truth and for knowledge and for preparation and to do it at the highest level possible. Those are the helping professions. Medicine is paradigmatic only because of the intensity of the kinds of problems we deal with. So, why is medicine so special from the ethical point of view? I've tried to give you a brief rendition of it, not a long one. Why? 
because of the nature of the relationship, of the human relationship. And I think sometimes we are under the influence of too highly conceptualized the notion of medical ethics and maybe should be thinking more experientially than we have in the past. That's not to say that we use experience to decide anything we want, no, but to try to put concept and experience together so that you have a fullness of the notion of what is happening in the intersubjective relationship between that patient. If you go into, and I speak to the young now, for other reasons, you will not be a true physician. You will do harm. You'll become famous. You may become rich. But like Dante, in the middle of his life, you're going to be asking yourself, what am I? Because of my advanced age, I have frequently become a father confessor not in the spiritual sense, father confessor for physicians at the midterm of their lives, wanting to know what to do. And forgive me, my friends, in bioethics, they want to go into bioethics. I'm not sure that's the best way. I help them retrieve, if I possibly can, what it is to be a physician, to be a physician. And the emphasis is on be not a set of qualities. I would apply it, as I said, and I do in the talk, more detail, but to the other helping professions. They need the same kind of resuscitation that we need. An awareness of the fact that we are involved in an activity not primarily for our own interests, and we commit ourselves to help others. That's inescapable. And therefore, I would say this is a morality of medicine that's intrinsic to the activities that go into medicine. I've tried to do that briefly. I think I've Use as much time as I want to try to stimulate you to some questions and answers and some contradictions, quite obviously. But just the final close. We initiate the process. How can I help you? We profess ourselves. Entering medical school, we make a profession. Public decoration on graduation. The present doesn't make you a doctor, you make yourself a doctor, and you do it every time you encounter a patient, every time. Thank you. Thank you. We're delighted to engage you in debate or whatever. Yes, sir. And yes, sir. Uh, Father Confessor, I think I need to start. Uh, I, uh, I've learned a lot from you, even though I've never met you, uh, I've, uh, in reading your writings throughout the years, and so I, I greatly appreciate what you, you've done. Um, I guess my question is that if medicine, the, the nature of medicine emerges out of a doctor-patient relationship, out of this communal relationship between a doctor and a patient. I, I want to agree that, I, I want to say, I want to hope that that is possible, that there are other... ...up in a, out of a communal context, and if the communal context out of which they are showing up. In other words, American uh, individualist, uh, individualism, uh, to demand to get what I want, when I want it, about, from my life. If that is the case, how, how, how I mean, it, you're, we have to become prophets in a way as, as doctors in changing their minds about those things. And that is enormously difficult. And so I kind of see what Bob Beach is saying, that we are, we are sort of expected to 
uh, answer them in a mode that that they want. Yes, I understand that, and, and your question's a very, very good one, but <clears throat> I'm sorry what I have to say is, is uh, probably not what you're looking for, but I think it's our task to say what you think is the right thing to do and not insultingly, obviously, always charitably, always with patience. And I think you will find that if you're firm in what you think is the right thing and tell them just what I said here, you're morally and legally responsible, that you have a conscience. Now, if this is the case, and therefore I cannot do what you ask me to do. And what I usually say is, perhaps some other doctor is better for you. That doesn't mean that I won't be here when you want me. You can come back anytime you want, but if you want assisted suicide or whatever it happens to be, I cannot do it. And what happens, interestingly, and I know there are many experienced physicians here, Usually when they get into serious trouble, they come back to you because they know you're told the truth and you'll stand by you. Yes, we're in a situation today, and that's Robert Beach's point, which is based on a significant amount of experience, <coughs> that we can't tell everything about the total good. No, we're not experts on the total good, but we are experts on the medical part of it. And that doesn't mean apodictic, absolute, certain statements. We have very few of those. But it is this question of prudent judgment. I wish we all, all had had a liberal education which would teach the virtue of prudence and phronesis for Aristotle, because that's the business we're in all the time, making decisions with uncertainty. And the uncertainty may be in the patient's mind, very, very definitely. Uh, I will say, at least in my experience, handling it gently, people respect the fact that you have a moral position you will not violate. And when they really got a tough one, they want to know what you think. They may not do what you say. So I, that's the only way I know to handle it. Uh, I don't believe in courses that will solve things like this. Uh, as Aristotle said, virtue is taught by example. And there's only one way to teach medical ethics, and that's at the bedside. Don't teach it in class. At the bedside. And that means that clinical teachers have enormous responsibility. Because students, the young, even though they're a little bit concerned about us, and I'm sure they're right, nonetheless know no, very clearly, and are looking for models. Models of congruity between teaching and action. And that's where you see it. I can lecture for six weeks about bioethics. I turn my back at the wrong time once when I'm making rounds and I've destroyed that. We clinical teachers need to remember that. We have enormous power to change how people behave but it has to be indirect or personal. And for those of you who are Catholics and non-Catholics, evangelization, as Pope Paul pointed out, the most effective thing in evangelization is the behavior of the evangelizer, not the doctrine. Hi, uh, my name is Mike Redinger. I'm a second year medical student at Loyola University of Chicago. Um, I'm in the process of being molded into, um, I hope to be a very good physician. My question is, how can medical schools best train future physicians to be the kind of ethical yes. physicians we want them no, to your be? Your question is very, very good. <clears throat> First, don't, now you're not doing this, but don't blame the medical school for lapses in the morality of your relationship with the patient. Not you, but I mean, I'm speaking generally here. 
Uh, there's too much tendency today on the part of medical students to feel that the medical school has formed them. It cannot really form you if you have an understanding of what it is you're doing. And the way and the best way, and it's a hard way, and I know that my good colleague Mark Siegel from the University of Chicago must do it, but I'm sure everybody else doesn't, and that is to teach it at the bedside in that encounter. Let me give you an example. The other day uh, in the clinic, a <coughs> resident, not a student, came to me and said he wasn't going to see a certain patient who was 20 minutes late. And then he lectured me. He said, you know, doctor, you've got to train your patients. Train them early. <laughs> they come on time. And I said, young man, step aside. I'm going to see that patient. See me. Well, as luck would have it, it was an elderly woman, age 85, who couldn't find transportation. And he was going to have her come back three weeks later. Now, I'm no model, but he saw a senior physician bring the patient in, tell him, no, you're not going to see this patient. And here are the facts. And that's not lecturing him any further. I just want you to think about that. I think the problem is, and the older physicians will shoot me, we don't have enough good models teaching clinical medicine today. The bedside. The bedside is, is the place. Because as I said, if you saw me after all this expatiation on my part, turn my back. You say, this guy is, doesn't have it. And you would probably have your first attraction to the model because that model is technically a good orthopedic surgeon or a good neurosurgeon, which you would like to be. And then you take up his other or her other characteristics. And so I fall to many of our clinical teachers for not paying attention to that. That's the responsibility of a clinical teacher, but it doesn't come out of books. You can read books that will help you get a feel of it, yes, but you've got to see it. Otherwise, you get to be a surgeon who throws calipers around the place, or an internist who yawns when the patient is telling their past history, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, could I push you a little on that? concept and, the, and you will yes, sure. the issue of, of uh, supervision. Uh, have our teaching hospitals strayed so far from their primary roles that they are now hostile to the education of the next generation of physicians? Yes. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> instead of looking at it as a teaching environment, I happen to be a product of Bellevue Hospital, New York City, five years of exposure, uh, and I'm not going to romanticize about it, but the notion of being a teaching hospital was run through the whole thing. And I was, some of you will think this is ridiculous, but it meant a great deal to me. I was walking on the ward one day as a student with a spot on my white coat you know, in the way of students. And the attending, who happened to be a woman, said, where are you going? I said, I'm going down to see Miss Shaw. No, you're not. What do you mean? Look at your coat. I said, what's got? She said, you're not going there until you get a white coat. Now, you'd say that's trivial? No. What she taught me was this patient was important and it was something I was doing that was offensive to that relationship. And it would have been. Now, I'm not saying we should be doing that. I give that as an example. But we, it, in, in line of your question, we are not sensitized now to what it is to do good clinical teaching. Uh, 
Monk, I don't know if you agree with me, but I think we... Well, well I, I do agree with you, and, um, and I agree with the um, gist of the question. Uh, when, when we think that, that the most rapidly increasing uh, subspecialty in internal medicine at the moment is the hospitalist who is taking over the inpatient primary care in, in many teaching institutions around the country, and, and that on average the hospitalist has two to four years of clinical experience contrast to the people who trained you at Bellevue uh -huh. and, and trained me at Chicago, be people with 30 and 40 years under their belt uh, of clinical experience. And, and now, now we're saying that, that these young doctors will be the model of future generations. And I think what will be modeled is, is, a, new, is a new sort of medicine that, that does raise this concern that it will not be the kind that you're talking about or that m many of us in the, yeah. in the audience remember. Yeah, and I, as I say, I don't want to say the past was greater. I want to assure the students. I'm often asked, well, weren't the students in your time more ethically uh, oriented or better educated? The answer is absolutely not. <laughs> they were a biopsy of the American public, just as you are a biopsy of the American public. And so to be good, bad, and indifferent. And those of us who are teachers really believe that we can modify behavior. And that's Aristotle's answer to, can you teach virtue? Yes. Plato didn't think we could do so because he thought there was no one good enough with enough knowledge of the good to be an example. But Plato was a little more on the tough side while Aristotle was more human and understood that we had our foibles and our failures. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Dr. Pellegrino, how do we respond to when the good of the patient requires that the patient needs to change a lot more than anything we can do? This is particularly the case, for example, in some of the modern lifestyles of people uh, uh, taking advantage of overprescribing and people also uh, suffering from uh, what's going to be increasing number of diseases related to uh, obesity, uh, inactivity, bad lifestyle choices, it's clear the patient has to change. And if we tell them that, we seem authoritarian and paternalistic. Or at least that's where, how we're often viewed. Yes, that, that is correct. But what can we do except to, in a very gentle, repetitive way, say, again, back to what is the right thing to do? And uh, that's what they're looking for. Now, some are not going to do it. They're human beings. And the point that I made, I want to say again, is for the non-compliant patient, I always say, I'm here. Come back to see me when you decide what you want to do. Now, if something I can help you with, I will do it. One of the worst things we can do is retaliate against the patient. Then we violate that internal ethical morality of someone who is perhaps responding the way they respond to because of their state of vulnerability and so on. We need to, yes, sir. Uh, I would like to start by just thanking you for coming and speaking. Um, as well as, you closed your speech by mentioning that there is a relationship between a patient and doctor in every case, but in some cases it is more difficult to see than others. In the case of treating youth, treating a non-autonomous person, or largely viewed as non-autonomous, and is still coming to you, it still has that relationship of help, but he wasn't coming to you for it. If it's in the case of an infant or a coma patient who doesn't really relate with you, I was wondering if you could expand on those relationships that are harder to see, but as you hold, do still exist, what you think of those relationships. Well, I think, again, you respond to the patient in the situation in which they find themselves, and you find them. So you don't write general rules. I'm so much in agreement with this gentleman back here who talked about policies get in the way, too many rules, etc. One of the, I haven't covered all the problems, one of the bedevilments today is to take away from the physician the range of possibilities of what we can do. And because part of it, let me say, is our own fault. 
physicians have not learned the first rule, physician heal thyself. So we're responsible too. I'm not, haven't got time to go into both sides of it, but we're partially responsible for just those things you're talking about. Uh, so I would call for, what am I calling for? I'm calling for reflecting back on what it is we do every day, what the situation is in which we find ourselves, and what the internal morality. Now, some people don't like that term. I've been given a hard time in the literature because I talk of the internal morality. But by that I mean that there is something about the, the way in which we function in our relationship to those humans. And uh, there ought to be more of that understanding experientially of what it is to be sick and what it is to be a healer. I haven't talked about that at all. Uh, are we all right? That's right. All right on time? Yeah, we can okay. a couple of more questions, I would say. A couple more. Dr. Engelhardt. Here, I'm going to get it now, watch. <laughs> um, I don't know whether you'll get it. Um, you may be on my side on this point, or you may not. Yeah. It strikes me one of the remarkable shifts in how people understand themselves as physicians is how central being a physician is to their lives. If one is a priest, one is on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you show up. Increasingly, people are told, well, your family deserves more of a slice of your life as a physician. I can remember Michael DeBakey, a friend of my father, who used to keep his residents locked up in the, and over at the hospital, so they realized their patient came first. And they were allowed one hour a week to visit with their spouse in the parking lot to teach them. <laughs> uh, first thing is yeah, to take right. care of your patient. Now it's an uh, eight to five job. Uh, people are actually encouraged uh, not to make it an all consuming uh, endeavor. So the, the issue you're asking how one sees the old model clinicians, those that I remember from my youth, being a physician was an all consuming endeavor for them. That is, how they have prioritized their lives. Uh, being a physician was more important than being a, a, a father or a mother a husband or a wife, it came first, it trumped all other things. Whether right or wrong, there's a radical reconstitution of priorities. Yeah. You didn't speak to that, but I think that's probably integral yeah. to the change in self-identity. Yes, no question about that. But you see, I wasn't here to try to exalt what we did in the past. I, I was wanted... trying to answer the question why you might not have had the same kinds of teachers now than you had in the past, which you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, that's true, uh, true Chris, but... <clears throat> And, and that change has occurred. And all I can say is, uh, if that change has occurred, how do you within that? I want to call you back. What I'm trying to do is morally needle the profession, the students, myself, to reflect. Now, how you express it, I don't want to try to do the old model. Yes, for people like me, medicine was a way of life and still is. Now, that's hard for young people to grasp, and I don't want to try to sell it to them. But we live full lives. Well, I have seven children. Well, my wife had seven children. <laughs> she did the work. I think I've read as much as anybody in this room. I've done as many things. Now, that's not, but that's irrelevant, it seems to me. You have to decide it for yourselves. So, all I'm trying to do is say, think about this reality which doesn't change. What you said changes, no question, Tris and I. It is a factor. But what do we do about it? All I'm trying to do is to say, reflect on it. Reflect on what you're doing and what you're getting into and make those modifications in your lives. I can't tell you what to do and I don't want to tell you what to do. I want you to, but I do want you to stop thinking it's a job. Stop thinking that patient doesn't have a call on you, at least when you're in contact with them. The most horrible thing in the world, I'll just stop in a second here, is when I pick up the phone and call one of my buddies after five o'clock, and I get this sing song from every dawn, one of his offices. The office is open from nine to five. If you have a problem now, 
go to the emergency room or call 911. Period. And you've just seen him at 4 o'clock. And he just wrote a prescription. And you have a question. That's the kind of thing. Now, I'm not saying anybody should change your life. But does that get... What I'm trying to do is something that... A quotation I love from uh, Keats, the poet. He said, you know, moral axioms are not axioms until they're felt on the pulse. And I'm just trying to make all of you feel it on the pulse. As I repeat it, I have to feel it myself as well. Because today I still have people calling me at all hours of the day and night. That's not heroic, as was pointed out. Uh, that happens to be built into some of us. Don't say everybody should do that. But where do you stop? If you think it's a job, and you think it's an occupation, then your whole orientation is different than if you say, no, I've got more responsibility. I can't do them all. Yes, Tris, I have a family. Yes, Tris, I have community associations, responsibilities, and so on. I can tell you life is much more fun when you're busy and, busy and doing good things, and it uh, doesn't mean you can't ski down the slopes once in a while. That's what you like to do. Yes, Let me get you the last question. Five years ago, in a wonderful editorial uh, called Medical Ethics Aborn by War and Tyranny, you made note that uh, medicine is a wonderful societal weather vane of our morality. With the collapse of our economic society as we begin to see it due to unregulated greed, what do you see happening to medicine as part of a moral weather vane embedded in this society? Well, I think we're a weather vane in the wrong direction. <laughs> the commodification of medicine, the businessification of medicine, the laying down $1,500 and I'll see you you know what I'm talking about, boutique practice. I'm sorry if I offend anybody. This is, from my point of view, the kind of thing you're talking about. And the only way I know to change it is to have people talking about and needling, because I think most of us in medicine have an inner sense of the morality of what we're doing, and it needs to be reawakened, or at least instilled. Okay. Thank you all very much. Let me say before you do anything, I apologize to anyone I've offended. I've stated my case strongly. I believe it, but you don't have to believe it. But I do ask your forgiveness if I have offended anyone unintentionally. Not my view. I did want to needle you. Thank you. I think it probably is true that Dr. Pellegrino doesn't have any enemies, and now you see why. I will remind you that there's a sumptuous reception waiting. Uh